Live from Sydney, 7 News with Ann Sanders. In breaking news, first at four, there's been an incredible end to a three-day search for a missing autistic boy in Victorian bushland with William Callahan found safe and well. The 14-year-old spent two nights lost in freezing temperatures. I was just wandering through the bush and uh, it was quite thick, so just breaking my way through it. And then he, he was just like about 15 metres from me just standing there. He's really angelic. More than anything, thank you everyone. No, I'm so grateful. You're all amazing. And we'll be crossing live to our reporter on the scene. That's coming up shortly. It's now been more than two weeks without a confirmed case of coronavirus identified in the community across New South Wales. With that, restrictions continue to ease. The go-ahead now given to restart community sports. Chief reporter Chris Reason has been following this story. Chris, it's a big day for sports fans. It is, and good afternoon to you. And for many people, just a common sense one. As you know, a week ago, they approved community sport for under 18s, but not for adults. Many people asking why that discrepancy. Well, today they have overturned the rules and allowing all adults to participate from July 1st. A welcome move for so many, and of course, a lifeline for so many sporting organisations. 2.6 million people in New South Wales uh, participate in some kind of, of sport. This approval allows them back onto all fields and into venues, but what we don't know is the exact rules for spectators, mums, dads, families, supporters, how many will be allowed to gather on sidelines. And it comes as the government's also easing restrictions, of course, at stadiums, 50 fans per existing restaurant or corporate box with a maximum of one person per four square metres. The same rules as pubs and clubs right now. The announcement was made by the Sports Minister this morning. Whether you're 18 or below, whether you're 18 or above, it's game on for everybody. The four square metre rule will apply. Social distancing of 1.5 metres will apply. We're just working out in terms of numbers. Now, still on sport and, and calls by the Deputy Premier, John Barillaro, today to open up the grandstands now and even have up to 40,000 fans in ANZ Stadium from this weekend were unfortunately completely rejected today by the Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, on sunrise this morning. Weddings, reception giants, uh, Navara venues. Boss Sal Navara is also standing by his threat to go ahead and open the business in July in breach of current rules and despite threats of stiff penalties. Two examples there of the massive pressures now building on the state government to do more and do it faster. The government saying it will only do it on uh, any moves on health advice, but hinting that the next move they will make is to open up food courts at shopping centres throughout the state. And Thanks very much, Chris. A man charged with murdering his sister at their Western Sydney home will remain behind bars until at least August after he was denied bail. Friends and family are now paying tribute to Gabriella Delaney as Andrew Denny reports. Well, two days after the body of Gabriella Delaney was discovered inside her Western Sydney home, police still have it cordoned off as a crime scene as they work to get to the bottom of exactly what went on here. This morning, her 30-year-old brother, Lucas Delaney, faced court on one count of murder. He chose not to appear as the case against him was adjourned for eight weeks and he was formally refused bail. Tributes for the young artist and university student are being shared by friends and family online, describing the 20-year-old as gorgeous, sweet, quiet and talented. Police suspect she suffered traumatic blunt force trauma to her head and died sometime last Wednesday. It would be six days before her body was found when her parents in Western Australia couldn't reach her and contacted police. Her brother had stayed at a series of motels in Western Sydney before checking himself into a mental health hospital, allegedly with a history of bipolar and drug use. Anti-domestic violence campaigners say sadly many women are experiencing violence within their own homes and help is available. It's really, really important um, that if you're at home uh, right now and you're um, feeling unsafe, that you know that services are there to support you. Um, you can contact 1800 RESPECT. The murder case returns to court in August. Federal Parliament has resumed, with four Labor MPs heading for COVID-19 tests, then forced to isolate because they attended weekend Black Lives Matter rallies. Political correspondent Tim Lester is live in Canberra. Hello, Tim. Is there any evidence these MPs might have the virus? 
Hello, Anne. Well, no, uh, certainly no, uh, nothing from the MPs themselves that they have any of the symptoms that might be of concern here. In fact, two of the four of them attended rallies in the Northern Territory where there are no known active cases of COVID-19. The other two in Brisbane where case numbers are very low. No matter, this is now a political fight over whether they should have observed the wishes of the Chief Medical Officer and stayed away from the rallies or helped supporters of Black Lives Matter seize the global impetus from protests and join in. There are also two Green senators who attended rallies, one in Sydney and one in Melbourne, and they so far have declined to be tested. I'm following the advice of the Chief Medical Officer who said that it wasn't necessary to self-isolate. And I'm, I'm very confident that uh, my risk was minimised being at the rally and I'm minimising risk to myself and to others being here today. Mass protests breaching our public health laws could cause lives to be lost. This race baiting is not welcome here. This violence is not welcome here. And this disrespect for public health and the Australian community is most certainly not welcome here. Tim, in other news today, the administrator at Virgin Australia wants the government to help protect the airline while it's sold. Apparently so, Anne, indeed, has apparently written to Prime Minister Morrison making two specific requests of the federal government. One, that it extend the giant JobKeeper wage subsidy program for six months more for the more than 9,000 workers at Virgin, and also that it uh, guarantee the airline's troubled ticket sales. Labor has been arguing that there is a need for greater flexibility with JobKeeper. We call on the government. Stop putting politics before people when it comes to the review of JobKeeper. Stop leaving people out and leaving them behind. This comes just two days after the government announced it would turn off the JobKeeper wage subsidy for workers in the childcare sector. And Tim Lester, live in camera. Thank you, Tim. More than two weeks after his death sparked a global uprising, George Floyd has been laid to rest next to his mother in Houston. As Paul Caddock reports, it was a day of unity, but not without controversy fuelled by the president. Good afternoon. It was emotional and it was powerful. George Floyd's family wanted it to be a celebration of the life of the man they loved. But today's funeral was also a call for justice and a call for change. More than two weeks after George Floyd's death, today in Houston, those closest to him came to mourn and farewell. George Floyd and his big smile and sense of humor can never be replaced. Celebrating a life. I just want to say I, to him, I love you, and um, I thank God for giving me, giving me my own personal Superman taken too soon. When George Floyd went down, the whole nation and the world rose up. He went down in hate, we're rising in love. Presidential hopeful Joe Biden sending his regards in a video message. To George's children and grandchild, I know you miss your dad and your granddad. Daddy's looking down, he's so proud of you. In the crowd, a familiar face, someone who's walked the Floyd family's path. Don Damon, fiancé of Australian woman Justine, murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm so disappointed, um, and I just really want to put my arms around Roxy and her daughter. As George was being laid to rest, protesters continued to march, saying they won't rest until there's change in America's police departments. No justice, no peace. President Donald Trump overnight adding fuel to the fire, tweeting a conspiracy theory about an elderly protester knocked to the ground by police last week, saying he was pushed away after appearing to scan police communications in order to black out the equipment. The 75-year-old remains in hospital in a serious condition. In Houston, hundreds of people lined the streets on a scorching day as George Floyd's golden casket was taken to its final resting place. Two weeks ago, in Minneapolis, in his final moments, he called out for his mother and has been laid to rest beside her today. The World Health Organization has been forced to backtrack after comments that suggested people infected with COVID but not showing symptoms were unlikely to spread the disease. We do know that some people who are asymptomatic or some people who don't have symptoms can transmit the virus on. 
The WHO says the original statement was meant to reflect the limited studies into asymptomatic cases. Meteorologist David Brown joins us now. A lot of low cloud around today, Brownie. Yeah, spot on, Anne. In fact, uh, we've had a mixture of rain and drizzle as well, but I must say, look, most of the wet weather has been confined to coastal areas. So far, 5 to 10 millimetres since 9 o'clock this morning, and we are expecting extensive fog tomorrow. At the moment, well, it's sitting on 16 degrees in the city, got a gentle northeasterly breeze. The radar signature paints, well, patchy rain. It is very light and patchy falling across uh, the metro area at the moment. The thing that stands out though the bulk of it is sitting off the coast. Let's go uh, to Parramatta right now. It's cloudy. We've got some uh, distant drizzle sitting in here. But as I mentioned, fog is uh, definitely on the cards first thing tomorrow morning. In fact, our model paints this fog unfolding during the wee hours of the morning, then gradually clearing probably soon after 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Uh, right now, current temperatures, well, 16 degrees just about everywhere. High in the Blue Mountains, it's 11 degrees in Katoom. And of course, local forecasts in detail, top of the hour. And All right, see you then, Brownie. Thank you. Still to come in Sydney's Afternoon News on 7, story of survival. An autistic boy missing in bushland for days. We're live to the scene. Bus, a movement sweeping the UK and Europe, removing historical statues. And hiding beneath the earth, how this ancient city was rediscovered. You're watching 7's 4pm Sydney News. This is the view from Blacktown, where right now it's 16 degrees. Returning to our top story, 14-year-old autistic boy William Callahan has been found alive after spending two nights lost in freezing conditions north of Melbourne. Live to Laurel Irving at Mount Disappointment. Hello, Laurel. Some truly great news after what looked like a hopeless situation. Oh, it was, it was uh, looking a little grim, and for sure, but what wonderful news for everybody here at Mount Disappointment. Just before midday, we got the news we'd all been waiting for for days, that 14-year-old Will Callahan had been found alive, and not only alive, but seemingly well. As you said, he'd spent two nights out here in freezing conditions, barefoot, wearing just track pants and a jumper, and his mum was here along with hundreds of people who were trying to look for her son. Every type of emergency service you can think of, but also hundreds of ordinary Victorians who flooded here just to help out. And in fact, it was one of those volunteers who found Will. Uh, his mum had spoken to us just an hour earlier saying that she was praying for Will, but she was a little optimistic because he was fit and resilient. And then just before midday, we got the news he'd been found. And certainly his mum, Penny, was overwhelmed with relief Relief, but also gratitude. Thank you, everyone. I, I'm, no, I'm so grateful. You're all amazing. When you I didn't well. believe it. I just thought, uh, you know, I, you know, I can't imagine what he's been feeling and going through. What's the first told? thing you guys are going to do when life gets a little bit back to normal? I'd like to take him on a holiday. I think. And Laurel, we've heard from the bushwalker who found William. He's now a real hero. What's he told us about the condition of the boy? That's right, Anne. I had a long chat with Ben Gibbs afterwards. He's a local to this area, grew up around here, says Mount Disappointment is his family mountain. He followed the markers made by searchers yesterday and went just a little bit deeper on instinct into the bush and he came upon Will. He said he was just standing there and he described uh, how Will was when he found him. Let's take a listen. I heard that he liked Thomas the Tank and so I just sort of talked to him about diesel and stuff like that. He looked in reasonable health, you know, he wasn't shivering too much, too bad. He didn't have socks on so I put some socks on him and a jacket. Will is being checked over at the hospital, but he seems OK remarkably. And his mum says the first thing he asked for was McDonald's. So I'm sure that is in his very near future as well. And what an incredible Really story. wonderful news this afternoon. Laurel Irving reporting. Thank you very much, Laurel. More statues are being removed across Europe as the Black Lives Matter movement triggers fresh debate about some countries' imperialist past. In Belgium, a statue of King Leopold II was brought down. His brutal rule of the Congo resulted in millions of deaths. 
In Britain's Oxford, a campaign is growing to remove a monument of colonialist Cecil Rhodes, while in London, a statue of an 18th century slave trader was taken away. The city's mayor has ordered a review of London's monuments and street names. An ancient Roman city buried deep beneath the earth has been revealed by scientists using ground-penetrating radar. A temple, theatre and public monument are among the images visible after the four-month study. Founded in 241 BC, the city stood for nearly a thousand years with little more than this entranceway remaining today. Next in 7's Afternoon News, a gunman on the run in Western Sydney after shooting up a house full of people. Worthless insurance, the claims that have landed another big bank in court. And in Sport with Jim, Tigers champion Benji Marshall sent home from training after a biosecurity breach. Tonight on 7 News with Mark Ferguson. A teenager survives days lost in the bush. Why our universities could be about to lose billions. And is this image photoshopped? Tonight on 7 News at 6. Police are hunting for a gunman after shots were fired at a home in Westmead overnight. Five people, including a teenager, were inside the property. Fortunately, none of them were injured. Probably around quarter to ten. We just heard some official sounds. It's probably ten rounds of bullets. We just panic inside. I think, yeah, we don't know what to do. Police say a dark SUV and a white vehicle may have left the area soon after the shooting. The Commonwealth Bank has been hit with a class action lawsuit over the selling of junk credit card and personal loan insurance with claims worthless products were sold to hundreds of thousands of customers. Law firm Slater & Gordon has now launched action against all of the big four banks. It reached a settlement worth close to $50 million with NAB last year. Time for sport now with Jim Wilson. Hello, Jim. And COVID protocols back in the headlines in the NRL. They are, Anne. Good afternoon to you. Afternoon, everyone. Hot on the heels of being axed from first grade, the West Tigers co-captain, Benji Marshall, has breached NRL biosecurity protocols. Now, Marshall approached our chief league reporter, Michelle Bishop, this morning and failed to adhere to social distancing guidelines. And Michelle has since been tested for COVID-19 and Marshall is in quarantine. We'll have exclusive pictures and more details in 7 News tonight at 6. Marshall says he's shocked at being left out of the team to play Canberra on Saturday. Uh, I was a little bit shocked and disappointed that I uh, got dropped, but just need to be better, mate. So, um, yeah, I understand where he's coming from and I just got to train hard again and um, show them what I got to get back in the team. Josh Reynolds replaces Benji at 5'8 for the Tigers. Mitchell Pearce says the Knights need to back up their big win over the Raiders with another 80 minutes performance this weekend. Newcastle takes on the Melbourne Storm in Gosford on Saturday, looking to atone for the 30-point thrashing they caught from the Storm at Amy Park last year. They did teach us a big lesson down there last year, Melbourne, when we went, went down there after a streak. And we started in decent form, but we've got a long, lot of improvement to go and we've got to you know, turn up again on Saturday. And Souths say the return of James Roberts and Cody Walker will provide the boost they need against the Titans at Bankwest Stadium on Saturday. Wayne Bennett's men have lost their last three matches. A big win this afternoon for Sydney's AFL teams and their loyal fan bases ahead of the season restart tomorrow. The Giants have been given permission for up to 350 fans to attend Sunday's game against the Kangaroos in corporate and catering areas. It's fantastic. Um, obviously, they're such an important part of the club and They've really stood by us through this challenging period and um, it's nice to be able to, I guess, thank them and, and uh, we'll certainly welcome them with open arms. The Swannies can also host up to 350 fans in corporate facilities for their return game against Essendon at the SCG. Cricket's governing body has confirmed a number of interim rule changes to reduce the risk of coronavirus. When internationals resume next month, shining the ball with saliva will be illegal. Teams risk a five-run penalty if they ignore umpire warnings to stop doing it. Now, during tests, teams will be able to replace players who show symptoms of COVID-19 on a like-for-like -like basis. The first teams to play under the new rules will be the West Indies and England in their test series in Southampton beginning on July 8. 
Premier League giants Manchester United have narrowly avoided exposing their biggest stars to coronavirus just minutes before United was due to play a practice game against Stoke. The Championship side's manager Michael O'Neill was told he tested positive for COVID-19. The match was immediately abandoned and United says none of their players were put in danger. The Premier League has conducted more than 6,000 tests in recent weeks with 13 positive results. The season resumes next Thursday. The PGA Tour returns from its COVID-19 hiatus in Texas tomorrow night against a backdrop of racial unrest. As protests continue across the United States, players are spreading a message of unity. We're all the same. We're all human beings and we should all be treated the same way. I'm just super you know, fortunate to be able to say something and it matter, but also be a part of the change. Jason Day, Mark Leishman and Cameron Smith are among six Aussies in the field. Now, just returning to that earlier story regarding our chief lead reporter, uh, Michelle Bishop, she has undergone tests this afternoon and for COVID-19. Those test results we're still awaiting, but certainly from the West Tigers' perspective, Michelle was perfectly legitimate to be standing where she was at training earlier today, and they have made an apology to our Chief League reporter. We'll have more on this developing story in 7 News at 6 o'clock. All right, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. This afternoon's top stories are next, including the happy ending in the search for an autistic boy lost for days in bushland, plus low-risk shocking revelations why infected passengers were allowed to leave the Ruby Princess. Australian University is now rated among the world's best, so why is China telling students to steer clear? And a photo with the Queen, a rare appearance for Prince Philip's 99th birthday. Live from Sydney. 7 News with Ann Sanders. Welcome back. Our top story this afternoon, the incredible survival of an autistic teenager missing for two nights in dense Victorian bushland. The mother of 14-year-old William Callahan thanking his rescuers. I can't. You've been feeling and going through and, you know, he's um, really just been feeling and so grateful and so relieved. She says William is quite calm considering what he has been through. An inquiry into the Ruby Princess COVID-19 outbreak has heard officials let passengers go ashore because there were no confirmed cases on board. Despite 21 eventual deaths linked to the ship, authorities initially rated it low risk. As Brian Seymour explains. Yes, good afternoon. New South Wales top biosecurity officer came under intense questioning from the Commissioner and Councils assisting today over the decision to allow 2,700 passengers to disembark here in March. Dr Sean Tobin was accused of helping to spin the Health Department's position into their handling of the crisis. Why didn't you do anything? It didn't occur to me that that was a strong enough reason to um, suggest negative critique. What we first do is assess the level of risk and we assessed it as low risk. Dr Tobin said many passengers had flights to catch. Their personal freedom was a factor while waiting for 13 tests to be done on land. There was no test on board for COVID-19. The 104 passengers who were confirmed to have acute respiratory illness should have received three swabs each, but only a total of 10 was taken. It's not something you would shrug about. It's, 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 it's wrong not to have drawn to attention a deficiency in intended systems. Is that correct? Commissioner Brett Walker said the Health Department's still unfinished report smacked of spin doctoring and dishonesty to obscure the truth. Nearly 700 people have been infected with COVID-19 from the Ruby Princess. 21 have died. The Special Commission of Inquiry is due to hand down its report in August. China has warned students against returning to Australia for study, claiming there have been several cases of discrimination against Asians during the coronavirus pandemic. As Cameron Price reports, the timing couldn't be worse for universities already facing major financial pressure. The warning from China's Ministry of Education came out late yesterday, aimed at its residents who study here claiming that during the pandemic there have been discriminatory incidents against Asians in Australia and that Chinese nationals should be cautious in choosing to study in Australia. That message sending shockwaves through an industry already under considerable financial pressure due to COVID-19. Well, we disagree with it. 
Uh, Australia is an uh, open and welcoming uh, country. We are very popular uh, with um, international students. More than one million people of Chinese descent happily, safely and proudly live in Australia. And I think they all put the lie to the claim of the Chinese Communist Party that this is an unsafe country uh, for Chinese people. This is just the latest in a series of diplomatic moves by China over the past few months, including barley tariffs, beef bans and more recently a travel warning. China, though, insists it has no connection with Australia's role in pushing for an international investigation into the origins of COVID-19. Australians are showing a new willingness to spend as COVID restrictions ease and the economy reopens. Live to Network Finance Editor Gemma Acton. Hello, Gemma. What do the latest numbers tell us? Well, and these numbers come from the big banks looking at what customers are spending on their credit and debit cards. And the message is that spending is higher than it was a month or two ago, but still quite a lot lower in most categories than it was a year ago. There are some exceptions to this. One exception is beauty spending, which is up around 9% on a year ago. Now that beauty salons are open once again, we're keen to catch up on all those appointments that we missed. Another area is fitness equipment. Now that the weather's getting worse outside and gyms are still closed, we're still stocking up on equipment that we can use inside the house to keep healthy and fit. But if you look at other categories such as travel accommodation or dining out, we see that the numbers are trending higher every single week, but spend is still lower than it was a year ago. And Gemma, with credit cards spending on the rise, there are fresh warnings about interest rates. Yes, and so there was a period in time when credit card interest rates moved in lockstep with the Reserve Bank cash rate. What we've seen recently, in the last decade, the Reserve Bank cash rate has dropped from close to 5% to close to 0%. Yet the average interest rate on credit cards hasn't moved at all. It's still around 19%. Now, the banks say, look, people who want high interest rate credit cards are usually going after rewards or benefits. But consumer advocates say check very closely that they're worth it. We have seen the value that people gain from using rewards cards go down over time in the market. And in fact, it will probably continue to go down. We'll have more information on what high interest credit card rates could be costing you in our 6pm news bulletin tonight. All right, um, Gemma, thank you very much. Being pregnant during a pandemic is proving as unpredictable as it is stressful for many expected mums. Now, an Australian trial is looking at the impacts COVID-19 is having on unborn babies. Brittany Lane has more. Well, the last time the MARTA conducted a similar trial was after the 2011 Queensland floods, which found the disaster caused significant effect on expecting mothers and their unborn children. Now, the trial focusing on the pandemic's effects. I've definitely been way more anxious than what I was in my last pregnancy. 300 expecting families are being assessed on their social, emotional, financial and physical health during the crisis and also after they've given birth. It does help us understand a lot more about how we can best help families in particularly in, in times of stress. One of the things that is a major driver behind anxiety and stress is social isolation. The 2011 floods data found the stress affected the placenta and also made changes to the development of the newborn. Children who were in utero at the time of the 2011 flood have higher levels of anxiety. When they're in, in utero they can pick up on stress and anxiety and things like that and that was very apparent when I had my first child. The trial is supported by the lot who have donated $500,000 to the research. The trial will also follow up on the children looking at their neurological development and what they've experienced as they've gotten older. A German student who broke into a Sydney museum before taking selfies with the dinosaur exhibit has been fined $500. CCTV cameras were rolling as Paul Kuhn broke into the Australian Museum in the middle of the night last month. The 25-year-old was given a 12-month community corrections order. He's apologised, saying he was drunk at the time. Deputy Premier John Barillaro and Andrew Constance have put aside their differences today, giving Seven News an exclusive look at the work being done to clear rural properties destroyed in the black summer bushfires. Serena Adeloro is following this story. Serena, how's the cleanup program tracking? 
Well, and we can reveal the state government's bushfire recovery effort has passed some major milestones with $2.3 billion hitting the ground already. The cleanup charging ahead through COVID. Around half of the state's destroyed properties have been cleared already for free thanks to state government funding. Huge thank you because I wouldn't have been able to even get things done. The Deputy Premier John Barillaro and Andrew Constance, member for Bega today, put aside their differences and stood together. This is not about the politics of bushfires. This is about everybody's future. I think this is a story of success on how you can actually come out of disaster into recovery. Now, Anne, a bushfire inquiry here at State Parliament has today exposed the health impacts of that toxic bushfire smoke. Recent modelling unveiling around 445 people died in the Black Summer bushfires due to smoke exposure. Among them, a 19-year-old who died of an asthma attack when smoke filled their town of Glen Innes. She had no symptoms. She was found in her bed with her phone torch on and her reliever medication quite close to her. The inquiry also heard there were around 2,000 respiratory hospitalisations with calls now for reform and clearer reporting on air quality, And Thank you, Serena. Prince Philip is celebrating his 99th birthday, marking the occasion with a new photo released by Buckingham Palace. The Duke of Edinburgh is captured alongside the Queen while they are in quarantine at Windsor Castle. Hugh Woodfeld has more. The celebrations will be low-key, just the way that Prince Philip likes it. But this photo has been released to mark this special occasion, the Duke of Edinburgh's 99th birthday. The photograph taken in the quadrangle at Windsor Castle last week. That's where the Queen and Prince Philip have been living throughout this lockdown. It's apparently the longest that they've ever spent together for a continuous period, having lunch every day. Of course, they're able to do that because of the coronavirus crisis and because the Queen has largely stopped doing public royal duties because of the crisis. We have, though, seen quite a bit of Her Majesty throughout this time with two historic uh, television broadcasts. Exceedingly rare, though, to see Prince Philip at all these days after, of course, he retired from public life back in 2017. So how will they be celebrating? Well, we know that the royals don't really do birthdays that don't end in a naught, but there there will be video calls. Uh, Members of the royal family dialing in from around the UK, Prince Philip's children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, maybe even Harry, Meghan and Archie calling in from LA too. The parents of Madeleine McCann are urging German authorities to reveal their evidence and explain why they are so sure the missing British girl is dead. Of course, both father and mother, they know that Madeleine may have been murdered. Uh, And so that's a possibility. But I don't know why the German prosecutor is so strongly convinced that Madeleine is dead. A former neighbour a prime suspect, Christian Bruckner, claims the convicted pedophile told her Madeline was dead and no one would find the body. Denmark's Crown Princess Mary has attended her first public event since the country's coronavirus lockdown began. The Australian-born royal opened a design museum in the capital, Copenhagen. It's very inspiring. It's a wonderful museum, a fantastic uh, cultural his- history journey of, um, from industry to de- decoration. During the visit, Princess Mary met glassblowers and viewed the world's largest collection of ceramics. We're live to ComSec for the latest on your money next. Plus, cholesterol complacency, the decisions putting Australians at risk of heart disease. The results are in. Whose drinking habits change the most during lockdown? And at 16 degrees in Bondi, Brian has Sydney's forecast soon. The results are in on our changed drinking habits during the coronavirus shutdown. A survey has found close to 20% of Australians are drinking more than they usually do. The biggest jump was seen in women aged in their mid-30s to mid-40s. The main reason for increased drinking was being stuck at home while stress, anxiety and boredom have also driven up alcohol intake. Checking finance now with James Tower. Comsec. Hello, James. The winning streak continues for the ASX. 
Yeah, that's right. And good afternoon. Just today, we're up about three and a half points for the ASX 200. So a seventh straight day of gains for the ASX 200. It's the first time since October last year that we've managed to uh, reach such a feat. But uh, it sounds small, but it was still a pretty good performance considering that we had the ASX 200 down around 50 odd points or close to 1% lower at the start of the day. We had the banks and energy stocks weighing the most, uh, but a turnaround and some improvements for the likes of our healthcare, tech and also retailing stocks helped to lift the market a touch. We had Harvey Norman up around 7% and Afterpay also at the best levels in record. The Aussie dollar around that 70 US cent mark at the moment, Anne. James Tao from Comsec. Thank you, James. Well, it seems even suffering a heart attack isn't enough to shock many Australians into looking after their cholesterol. Jody Lee has the details of a landmark national study. Well, we already know that heart disease is Australia's biggest killer, but new research has found as a nation we're failing to manage it. A fresh report by the Baker Institute here in Melbourne has found more than half of high-risk people, that's Australians already who have been diagnosed with heart disease, are failing to control their cholesterol levels. 80% of people started on a cholesterol-lowering medication. Only about 50% of them reach the target level. Women like grandmother Sophie Henderson are most at risk. I found out personally about my cholesterol levels is when I had my first heart attack. The 55-year-old suffered not one but two heart attacks in a fortnight back in 2018. Heart disease killed her father and her mother suffers from it too. Sophie knows she could be doing better in managing her cholesterol. I was prescribed a lot of medications, like all of a sudden I had, you know, eight tablets in my hand. By getting on top of our cholesterol levels, experts say we could save more than three and a half thousand lives and more than $66.6 million in healthcare costs. Sydney's 6pm News is coming up with Mark Ferguson. Hello, Mark. What are you working on in the newsroom? Yeah, good afternoon. And more good news on COVID restrictions. Playing fields across the state will be filled with children and parents from July the 1st in a huge boost to grassroots clubs. Tonight, why food courts are likely to be the next to reopen. We have fantastic news to bring you from Victoria. A young boy has somehow survived several days lost in the bush. Hear from his elated mum as well as the man who found him. Also, more startling evidence of the inquiry into the Ruby Princess, the concerning reason why health officials decided to let everyone off before COVID-19 test results came back. John Barillaro and Andrew Constance have put their differences aside. What cause brought them together again? Plus, the remarkable moment a fisherman got very close to a humpback in pit water. And all that and plenty more, Sydney 7 News tonight at 6 o'clock. Thanks, Fergo. 4.49, sir, let's check Sydney's traffic. Australia's bikini queen, Paula Stafford, is celebrating her 100th birthday. And while we couldn't be there due to the pandemic, today we look back on her fabulous life and career. She's one of our most famous designers, best known for putting the Gold Coast on the map the moment she cut her one piece into two. I used to wear a brief two-piece and everybody wanted them. So from a factory in Surface Paradise, she started making them for the masses and made plenty of controversy too. The beach inspector was told to tell her it was too brief which he did and I said well don't be upset be there tomorrow and I'll if, you, if you're put off the beach tomorrow I'll have lots of girls ready to go on. That was in 1952 and that stunt would make the bikini world famous. In 2014 Paula Stafford was inducted into the Business Leaders Hall of Fame. I really appreciate the honour which has been bestowed upon me. Today she adds centenarian to her long list of achievements. She'll probably feel like she's 80. Pam Burrows used to model for Paula. Anyone who came to the coast had to go to Paula's to have swimsuit made. The style was the favourite of another coast icon, the Meter Maids. We've been celebrating and um, wearing the bikinis for the last 55 years. Because of COVID restrictions, it was a low-key affair at her nursing home in Mermaid Beach, but so much to celebrate. On the Gold Coast, Amanda Abate, 7 News. Next in 7's Afternoon News, David Brown will be here with your latest weather forecast. David's here again with the very latest forecast. Afternoon, Brownie.
Yeah, it's cold and damp sort of an afternoon, isn't it, Anne? We're expecting fog first thing tomorrow morning. Today, well, the city reached a maximum of 16.4 degrees. That happened by late morning. And by the way, that's about one degree on the cold side of average. Some showers and isolated thunderstorms popped up along the western slopes of the ranges a short time ago. Also got, got some showers running along the spine of the Great Dividing Range as well. To the north, you'll notice it's sitting on 18 degrees in Tamworth. Canberra in the ACT at the moment, uh, 14 degrees. But the bulk of the wet weather, of course, is sitting offshore and the trough that's behind this unsettled weather is expected to well move further out to sea tonight and tomorrow we see that from our forecast chart although the thing that stands out is some showers just lingering over the northern part of our state tomorrow might see the odd thunderstorm also redeveloping around the uh, northern ranges but for the capitals tomorrow Brisbane some passing showers the forecast high around 23 degrees Melbourne a foggy start then a sunny day light winds and around 15 degrees another stable day is on the way for Adelaide around 16 degrees different story for southern parts of WA strong change is on the way that will move through tonight it'll bring areas of rain and storms to Perth tomorrow in fact most of uh, southwest WA top of 23 degrees in Perth. For our city, our forecast hop is around 20 degrees. Fog, well, first thing, should clear by around about uh, mid-morning. As for the next uh, seven days, here's the latest forecast. There it is. Another foggy star is expected on Friday. As for the weekend, generally fine. That's the latest weather. More at 6 a.m. Thanks a lot, Brownie. And that is Sydney's 4pm news for this Wednesday. Mark Ferguson will bring you the news at 6. I'm Ann Sanders. Stay with 7 now for The Chase Australia. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Have a good night.